As we kindle this flame, may it spark in each of us connection and commitment to this living tradition and to each other. Our gathering song this morning is number 1028, 1028, The Fire of Commitment. The words are copied in the chat screen. Please keep your mics muted and simply sing along at home if you would like. <laughs> My name is Ellie, my, pr my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and, I'm record and I am coming to you from the comfort of my home as you all listen from the comfort of yours. This service is being led by YRUU. Bruce Martin is our pianist and Barb Martin is our song leader. Ann Mowry is our pastoral care associate for this week. To respect the youth and this service, please keep your microphone muted during the entire service. After the service has finished, you are welcome to unmute and join the coffee hour breakout rooms. Commitment unlocks the doors of imagination, allows vision, and gives us the right stuff to turn our dream into reality. That is a quote from James Womack, research, di research director at Cambridge and Harvard graduate. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines digital service. This is our annual youth-led service. My name is Lillian Kearns. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the celebrant for this morning service. Whether you're with us for the day or here for a lifetime, 
We are glad that you have chosen to join us online. Everyone is welcome to join First Unitarian. Whoever you are, we hope that you find something here today to help you on your life's journey. for all ages.
I catch a star. By Oliver, Oliver Jeffers. Once there was a boy, and the boy loved stars very much. Every night, the boy watched the stars from his window and wished he had one of his very own. He dreamed how this star might be his friend. They would play hide and go seek and take long walks together. The boy decided he would try a catching star. He thought that getting up early in the morning would be best, because the star would be tired from being up in the sky all night. So the next day he set out at sunrise, though he could not see a star anywhere. He sat down and waited for one to appear. He waited, then he waited, and ate lunch. and waited. And after dinner, he waited some more. Finally, just before the sun was about to go away, he saw a star. The boy tried to jump up and grab it, but he could not jump high enough. So, very carefully, he climbed to the tallest tree he could find, but the star was still way out of reach. He thought he might lasso the star with the life belt from his father's boat, but it was much too heavy for him to carry. He thought he could fly up in his spaceship and just grab the star but his spaceship had run out of petrol last Tuesday when he flew to the moon. Perhaps he could get a seagull to help him. But the seagull he could find didn't want to help him at all. The boy thought he would never catch a star. But then he noticed something floating in the water. It was the prettiest star he had ever seen. Just a baby star. It must have fallen from the sky. He tried to fish it out with his hands, but he couldn't reach it. Then he waited and walked, and waited, and watched. And sure enough, the star washed up on the bright golden sand. The boy caught a star, a star of his very own. And now we have Sarah Long from the Stewardship Committee, and she would like to talk about our pledge drive. Uh, Reverend Amy's giggle-inducing offering announcements, Sally Buckholz's ability to juggle tons of church responsibilities single-handedly, say she's here today even, Mary Hayes' delightful four-page Christmas newsletter, Elaine M. Lau's jujitsu and selling a dining event that includes what? No dining for a whole year. Katie Allen's unfailing good humor in our Amos fight for kids, Deborah Rogers' dedication to us hopeless meditators, Barb Royal's dogged work on mounds of picky changes on the church's new website template. Why do I donate to the church? It's these people, of course. Who could not just love a church with people who have such heart, hope, spirit, and such a wicked sense of humor? It's a church that doesn't package up my spiritual path, but lets me unpack my own with lots of ideas on how to do that. 
And it's a working church where people are involved with each other, with the community and the world. And with the sermons here, nobody is snoring in the pews. I'm a relatively new member, but giving money to this church is even more important to me this year. In a time when I see my most important values in jeopardy in our country, I want to put more of my money where my mouth is, and my mouth has been a lot of places this year. I have spoken out against the selfish, racist, misogynistic, homophobic, anti-immigrant, and environmentally destructive direction that's popping up in our country. This is a church that pushes back hard against all those things. It is precious and important and a, and a barrel of fun. I want to see it grow and strengthen. And so I'm pledging and I'll be raising my donation this year. And as you are able, I hope you can join me. Thank you, Cheryl. At our next congressional annual meeting, we will be again selecting two organizations for the coming year for our Faith in Action partners, um, beginning September 21st or September of 2021, ending in August of 2022. The Faith in Action Committee is seeking nomination organizations for the coming year. If you know of an organization you believe to be a good fit for our UU community and are willing to serve as a champion, now is the time to begin the nomination process. The application will be available on our website at ucdsm.org. The champion will help the organization complete the application and the applications will be reviewed by the Faith in Action Committee and the nominee will have opportunity to communicate their programs to our UU community during the month of May. So why did the UU cross the road, you ask? To support the chicken in its search for its own path. Now, I ask you to please support the church's social justice programs and our faith and action partners, Planned Parenthood and Central Iowa Immigrant Support Coalition, as the morning offering will now be given and received through the link in the chat. Joys and Sorrows of the People. The church is not the building, but a community. As a community of human hands and human hearts, 
we come together to share our laughter and our tears and to bear witness and minister to one another as we struggle through life's sorrows and celebrate life's joys. There will be a tribute to Nikki Keller on Channel 5 WOI, not on Channel 8, as originally stated, on Tuesday, March 9th, on the 6 o'clock news. Mark your calendars. Unfortunately, Mediacom has removed the channel from their television lineup due to demands from Tegna that can be viewed online at HTTPS, yeah, the link in the chat. Let us share together now the names of anyone we know who could use some special care and attention. As you type the names into the chat, may the love of this community hold them all. May the light of our community shine on the broken places of the world. May the work of our hands and our hearts support, aid, and comfort all those who are marginalized, oppressed, silenced, or at risk. May we never look away when we are needed. May those who are grieving be comforted. May those who are tired find rest. May the broken places be healed. May those who are filled with joy and laughter be abundant. Now we'll sing Comfort Me. This is My Commitments to Myself by Laura Mancuso. I take care of myself first because I am deserving of exquisite care. I take care of myself to maintain the capacity to help others. I move and stretch my body every day. I spend time in nature attuning my senses to, yeah, attuning my senses to the earth's wisdom. I ration my daily exposure to the news. I identify and access credible sources of information. I protect myself from being overwhelmed by information about the pandemic. I place myself, I pace myself. I sit with the reality of uncertainty and impermanence and allow it to temper my desire for control. I listen without judgment to others' reactions, which may be different from mine. I forgive myself and others when stress brings out our shadow selves. I feel fear fully when I'm fearful. I experience sadness fully when I'm sad. I allow anger fully when I'm angry. I rel relish joy fully when I'm joyful. I seek out healthy pleasures and indulge them without guilt. I remind myself that feelings are transient states that move through me. They do not last, they do not define me, nor do my thoughts. I balance my drive for self-improvement with compassionate acceptance of myself as I am right now. I initiate contact with loved ones to let them know I hold them in my heart. I seek out with increased sensitivity those who are most vulnerable. If possible, I share my resources with those who need help to survive. When people when possible, I move away from people, situations, and experiences that do not serve my highest good. I strengthen my connection to my sources of spiritual strength so that I continue to be replenished. I acknowledge my near the nearness to death as a key motivator for living a full life. I pray for the suffering of all beings to cease. I grieve my losses and celebrate my successes. I remain open to new ways of being surprised, to, to new ways of being, surprising sources of joy and unanticipated discoveries every day. 
Please join me in one minute of silent thought, meditation, or prayer. Choose to Bless the World by Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. All of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer the que this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. A choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, but moving forward into the world with intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice and anathization or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude, to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice you will draw into your community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. For the centering song, I will be playing Burning Crescent on the piano. Thank you. 
For thousands of years, humans and wolves have been in a complicated and often damaging relationship. As human civilizations spread across the world, we often met and competed with wolves for the same space and resources. As we developed more and more untouched wilderness, this conflict only increased. Wolves were very adept at destroying basic protections for livestock, like cattle and sheep, easily digging under fences and chasing herds of our domesticated animals. In turn, we would kill wolves that came too close to our farms, and as we spread across the world, we came to see wolves as our instinctual enemies. The killing of wolves was such a popular activity that, in fact, only as recently as 1960 were wolves protected under the Endangered Species Act. Based on this troubled history with our lupine friends, people assume that wolves were dumb, savage animals that would more likely steal our babies and leave us alone. This idea was only strengthened by the big bad wolf narrative seen in many children's stories. This belief that wolves are the monsters of our nightmares is unfair and completely unfounded. Wolves, in fact, are not that much different than us. As anyone with a canine companion of our own can tell you, we must have seen some similarities. Why else would we have bred wolves to become dogs and allow them into our homes? What humans saw in wolves was their inherent sociability and complicated family dynamics that are not much different than our own. Wolves live in family groups called packs. These packs are led by a dominant pair of breeding wolves called the alpha male and alpha female. This pair leads the pack through thick and thin, making sure that their bloodline continues and spreads across the area. Underneath the alpha pair are the beta wolves. These wolves are usually the offspring of the alpha pair and help with hunting at direction of the alphas. Last in line are the omegas. Though low on the totem pole, these wolves are arguably the most important. Being affectionately known as the glue of the pack, they soothe and they soothe bad tempers, stop fights, and encourage play among their strong little family. These ranks are imperative to wolf survival and greatly resemble our own family dynamics. This can be seen at schools, at family reunions, the workplace, literally anywhere you look. For instance, at work you might notice someone who immediately takes charge of a situation and is easily able to lead a conversation or meeting. They might be followed by a group of co-workers who jump at the opportunity to help others with their assignments. You might also see the few who float between social groups, making sure no one gets too agitated. Our everyday interactions directly correlate with that of both social groups, showing us just how similar we really are. Now, you might be wondering, wow, cool, I'm so glad I know so much about wolves and how totally awesome and not scary they are. But, what's the point? Well, the point is, because wolves and humans are so similar, we can learn from their example. In comparison to our wolf counterparts, our population has exploded in the past thousand years or so. Humans, in fact, have become so successful that we no longer struggle to survive. Yes, in many areas, people don't have enough water, enough food, or enough space, but as a whole, we are defying the laws of nature and completely taking over the planet. Through this, what we gained in expansion, we lost in the belief that we are a whole. Now, instead of working together, people have the luxury to sit around and nitpick inconsequential tidbits instead of doing real good. Wolves don't have this luxury. If one wolf does not contribute in times of need, the pack will be greatly affected, and either will be weaker when fighting other packs, or they may not survive through harsh winters at all. Wolves are remarkable in their ability to survive in the planet's most inhospitable regions. Grey wolves, the most widespread species of wolf, live in one of the coldest places on the planet, the Arctic Circle. Because food is so scarce in the Arctic, wolves must work together in order to survive or risk starving in a hard winter. Because humans live in a reality that revolves not around survival, but continuing to thrive, we've lost the interconnectedness that wolves embody. It is no longer a, how can I help you to better our lives as a whole world? It is now a, how can I make sure that I have literally everything I could ever want? Yes, even that inflatable bouncy house. World. Now, this change has led to countless social and environmental issues that we are now needing to face. The protests this summer have shown us just how much our ability to dehumanize each other has affected the way we behave and see the world. I think we can all agree, it's time for a change. 
How do we change? <laughs> a good question with no easy answer. It requires drastically changing how the majority of our society works. It requires living without fear, hate, or prejudice against any one person or group of people. It requires the willingness to sacrifice just a little of what we have for each other and the earth. For a majority of people watching this, it requires that we sacrifice to make a more equitable, equitable future for everyone, even if that means giving the extra that we have to people who don't have enough. And finally, it requires the compassion and empathy that we had, but now seem to lack. In short, it requires commitment. We, as humans, need to renew our long overdue commitment to each other. We need to no longer see ourselves as separate, but as a whole. We are not different because of our skin color, our religious beliefs, and yes, even our political beliefs. We are all humans and we all share this planet. Mars isn't quite ready for habitation yet, so I vote, I vote we get used to being here. We also need to renew our long overdue commitment to the Earth. Our fate is as much intertwined with this world and its animals as the wolf is. Where one suffers, we all suffer. Throughout history, crises statistically bring people together. We start to understand again why we need each other. We start to understand that none of us should have to go through traumatic times alone. We become more human. We need to make sure that after the world reopens, we don't lapse into our former ways. We cannot continue living our lives as though none of the past year has happened. Things need to change. We should have all learned by now that the only way we can ensure a future for this planet and for future generations is to see ourselves as one people. Easy peasy, right? You're walking and walking mile after mile with me. The bridge, the university, the cemetery, a homeless man, poetry, quotes, Darwin, rain, trivia, a pregnant dying dog. But through everything, there's Koi no Yogan, inevitable love. That is a quote from 10 Miles One Way by Patrick Downs. It has its literal meaning, but it also has a symbolic meaning. You see, in the story, two teenagers named Nest and Q walk for 20 miles one night together. Q was not allowed to talk for the first half. The quote summarizes many of the things Nest and Q encountered seven miles into their walk. Deeper than that, however, is the meaning behind Nest's words. The commitment it takes to walk for 10 miles in pitch black, only listening and hoping for the sun to come is enormous. To be loyal enough to someone to walk with them and just listen. The quote not only talks about the literal adventures they pursue, but also puts meaning in the greater ones. Love and commitment come with adventure for better or for worse, but just as Nest said, there will always be one guiding principle through all of those adventures, inevitable love. I have committed myself to numerous things throughout my relatively short life so far, and never have I experienced what Nest describes, but I hope one day I live it. The closest is my commitment to learning. This may sound nerdy and cheesy, but I'm not committed to just learning anything. I've been interested in politics since sixth grade, so about three years now. Recently, however, just over quarantine, I fall in love with political philosophy and theory. I'm not interested in current events and the drama that comes along with them, but rather the roots, psychology, and history of all forms of economics and governments throughout humanity. I won't bore you with a rant on one of the many things I'm passionate about, but what I can say is I have become wrapped in commitment for political theory. It's the major I want to pursue in college, and although I acknowledge that it may be a short-lived passion, I have faith that one day my love for political philosophy will be an inevitable love. As I was proofreading this testimonial, Grammarly, my speech revision app, suggested that love was a redundant noun because it was following inevitable. Love in Nest's eyes must be part of commitment. She didn't believe it could be just any love, it had to be inevitable. Now, Grammarly could just be very optimistic and philosophical and think that love is inherently inevitable, 
But in Nest's eyes, a commitment was born through inevitable love. Inevitable love, love that is destined to be. The love's existence is uncontrollable and therefore undeniable. It is in this undeniability that a commitment is born, that the inevitable bond, connection, love will commit someone. Yet I believe commitment goes beyond passion and beyond love. Commitment is seeing something through to the end, even if it's hard and sometimes even if you don't want to. Commitment is sticking with it because you know it takes more strength to stay than to leave. Commitment is knowing that it is all worth it in the end because one's commitment will show decency, dependability, and integrity. So although commitment with inevitable love may be likable, more enjoyable, inspiring, or even stronger, that is not what commitment is born out of. I believe it is the opposite. Commitment is not born through inevitable love, but rather, Inevitable love is born through commitment. All right, Rachel and Ellie bring some hard speeches to follow, but um, when I was asked if I wanted to give a speech about commitment at our youth service this year, my first instinct was no. I'm already not a big fan of writing, and with school, online, DMAT classes, and a list of scholarship essays hanging over me, the last thing I wanted to do was commit to writing an essay about commitment, knowing that I would use to, need to use my precious free time for another essay. But then I got to thinking more about commitment and what it means to me, and how large of an impact the things we do commit to have on ourselves. I decided this could be a good opportunity to reflect on how the things I am committed to have affected my well-being, outlook, and life in general. I've noticed that as I've grown older, the opportunity to commit to things have, has grown exponentially, especially in our society, where doing things at every moment seems to be the norm. Having more opportunities available has made me realize more about what makes me feel fulfilled. I can think back to many times this winter where I felt short of something because of having too many commitments on my plate. Sleep ranked first, but there are many other things I felt were sacrificed. Swim meets for work shifts and vice versa, homework time for running, social times with friends for homework time, school for doctor's appointments, and the list goes on. With so many things to do and never enough time to fit it all in, I realized that to get the most out of your commitments, you cannot agree to do everything you or others want you to do or that you feel you should. Juggling so many balls takes a lot of energy. Yes, I was able to attend five days of in-person school a week, seven swim practices, two runs, facilitate my school's environmental club on Thursday mornings, participate in improv on Fridays, work the weekends at Starbucks, maybe lifeguard once during the week, and even cook some tasty meatless, tasty meatless dinners. But the biggest thing I just felt was busy. I felt like I was getting most things done, checking the boxes in my planner. But still, I didn't feel the fulfillment I was aiming for. When I think I can multitask, it always leaves me missing an important part. Well, I think I can multitask. It always leaves me missing an important part of a class or conversation. Too many commitments lead them to take away from one another. The results I've noticed from this is me accomplishing less and unable to take full advantage of the relationships that could have been built. So contrary to my intentions, my overflow of commitments has left me feeling less satisfied. Narrowing down the amount of things on my plate will allow for quality over quantity in activities and interactions. More time can be dedicated to things I choose to keep in my life. Doing less will allow me to accomplish more in what I do, and more importantly, it will make my remaining commitments more enjoyable. While not having enough commitments does tend to make me feel unconnected and as if I'm drifting through life, I think the solution to this quandary is finding balance. While on paper, I can fit in all of my commitments. To yield fulfillment, I must pick and choose what truly makes me feel happy and at my best. What would you have done if you'd been in my shoes? Here's what happened. My parents became vegetarian before my sister and I were born. So we were raised never eating meat. Growing up, we always had to pack lunches from home because our school didn't have reliable options. 
The menu of birthday parties and family events often had to be altered for our sake, and my classmates would always be shocked when I told them I didn't know what their favorite meat tasted like, asking questions like, but aren't you curious, and do you think you'll be vegetarian forever? Those aren't questions I thought about before being asked them, but they did stick with me. And the answer to the first one was yes. Anyone would be curious about something they'd never experienced. But that curiosity wasn't enough to get me to abandon the practice I'd maintained without fail. No, it was the second one that got me thinking. Because the first time someone asked me that, I was around six years old, and forever it seems like a really long time to someone that young. One of my immediate thoughts was, no way, I'm not going to keep doing this my entire life without ever knowing what it would be like not to. Then I spent a little longer on that question, and asked myself, why would I stop? Why would the reasons I have for being a vegetarian ever change? I realized that's what it means to commit. It's continuing to do something despite temptations otherwise. It's about knowing what motivates you and using that to stay on track. My situation might be different from others since I started as a vegetarian before I was old enough to choose for myself, unlike those who decide to make the change. So, where many would have thought of reasons to begin something new, I would need to think of why I should continue. This experience gave me a unique perspective on commitment, centered around living a way you might have not have chosen yourself, yet finding individual motives to stick with it. Because again, knowing what drives you is vital to successfully maintaining commitments. Sometimes keeping a commitment can still be challenging, even when you know what motivates you. You may have conflicting motivations to consider and reflect on. Some motives may be some subconscious or self-destructive. Trying to identify these can help you understand why a commitment is hard to keep and may help strengthen your reasons for staying on track. And over time, your values and priorities can change or you could learn new information that you didn't have before. All of these things might lead you to reevaluate your commitment, and that is okay. Nothing needs to be set in stone forever. Your dedication should lead you to be true to yourself, your loved ones, and your community. If a prior commitment comes into conflict with who you are now, you should look back at all the reasons you started to see if they still apply. They should be a reflection of your values. When your values and commitments are aligned, they're easy to keep. The extinguishing of the chalice will be read by will be read by me and written by Elizabeth Sell Jones. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our final song this morning is number 149, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The words are copied in the chat screen.
We are the ones we have been waiting for. May we be bold and courageous to chart that new future. May we have faith in a future that is not known.